I'm Krista Tippett. Today, a spirit of defiance. My guest, Marianne Pearl, was married to the Wall Street Journal correspondent Daniel Pearl, who was murdered by al-Qaeda operatives in Pakistan in 2002. A film based on her memoir, A Mighty Heart, opens in theaters this month. Daniel Pearl was killed in part because he was American and Jewish. Marianne Pearl, a Buddhist, speaks this hour about making sense of her husband's murder and her spiritual ethic on what she calls the front lines of the war on terror. Danny and I were very, very aware of what was going on. I think Danny knew he could die. I think I knew he could die. And I think uh, we both knew that somehow we had to oppose those people. So he did it in the face of death, and I did it in the face of life, you know, but it's the same defiance. This is Speaking of Faith. Stay with us. Look for Krista Tippett's celebrated new book, A Chronicle of Religion in Our Time, Speaking of Faith, the book, in bookstores now. I'm Krista Tippett. This month, a film based on Marianne Pearl's memoir, A Mighty Heart, opens in theaters nationwide. Her husband, Daniel Pearl, was murdered in Pakistan four months after September 11th. At that time, she was pregnant with their first child. In our 2004 conversation, Marianne Pearl spoke openly with me about her experience of human and spiritual dynamics on the front lines of the war on terror. She says that years of Buddhist practice gave her the clarity to see what the terrorists' goals were and how to resist them, an ethic of compassion and defiance that sustains her even today. From American Public Media, this is Speaking of Faith, public radio's conversation about religion, meaning, ethics, and ideas. Today, a spirit of defiance— Terrorism, Love, and Survival with Marianne Pearl. On January 23, 2002, in Karachi, Pakistan, Daniel Pearl went out to interview an elusive imam with suspected ties to al-Qaeda. He never returned home. The last time that Daniel Pearl was seen before he was abducted was... That- For me, is a tool. It's not a mean, but a tool to be able to live up to your own beliefs. That's what I use it for. And I think that's what he meant. But he also said, like, if something like a life and death situation would happen, then he would go to his own roots. To, to his Jewish roots. To his Jewish roots. He would explore that because that's the most natural thing for him. But in terms of uh, a belief on which you ground your life, uh, ethics was his answer. Mm. It's fascinating to me that his mother was an Iraqi Jew, that she was born in Baghdad of an ancient Jewish Iraqi family. Right, right. Of course, what happened to you and your husband was set in a much larger context of terrorism and the war on terrorism. I felt, uh, you know, that for us, it was like we were at the crossroad of international geopolitics because of the situation in in Palestine and Israel and now in Iraq, but also, I mean, just with the Muslim world in America and and Afghanistan, obviously. So I felt, uh, yes, you know, here we have the Jewish element and we have the American element and then the Muslim element. And really, that's like being at the center of the hall situation. And I think, you know, for Danny and I, um, that's why he said ethics, you know, because that was his way of approaching the world. He might have been Jewish, but that's something that didn't, uh, as far as I saw, alter his approach to people. Like he would not come as a Jewish person. He really came as a journalist. And what he put forward as, um, you know, his reason to meet the people or to do this job really were journalistic reasons to do that. You know, he really, I think it's this whole role of transparency and truth and truth telling. That's what mattered to him. So I think also for me, a religion is something on which you act upon and the fact that he died for that is still not something that made me change my mind. You know, the word ethics can sound a bit dry. It, it doesn't have a lot of generic meaning. You just use the words truth telling and truth and transparency. You might flesh that out for me a little bit more. What that word ethics meant for you and Danny in that place in which you found yourselves as journalists, but also as human beings. 
Well, it's very concrete. Yeah. <laughs> it was very concrete because it really is about how we were going to conduct our daily life and our work. So, for instance, you know, one of the main challenges for journalists abroad would be to the prejudices, your own prejudices. So, it's, for instance, it w- that was a constant battle to always double check with yourself and your opinion on things and having this really demanding attitude, which was, you know, never take impressions for granted or or people for granted. And, you know, that kind of approach was very difficult in India or Pakistan because it's such a strong country and that uh, you have so many impressions and you have so many prejudices and you have so many cliches that... To fight them, it has to be a very conscious effort. So that's that's what I mean, for instance. That was also an ethical act for you, was fighting your own prejudices as you encounter that new culture. Yeah, yeah, it was the basics of it. Yeah, it's really like a conduct, like on how you behave as a human being, mm. as a professional. It's, it really is it's about your interaction with the world. That's what I mean by ethics. Uh, in no way for me, I think it's something, you know, like a general, broad, uh, you know, system of value. It's really something that I walk on. It's, it's really the ground on which I walk. Yeah. So something else that really jumped out at me as you describe arriving in Pakistan is how very aware you were of, of poverty, of the condition of people. There's this scene where you meet, I believe, the servant of the woman you're staying with, and you say she was pregnant but I dare not say, like me, because you were aware that the life of that child growing up would be quite different from the life of your child. Right. You know, the poverty in the world is um, is something that uh, I had, you know, seen before, but in this part of the world, especially in India, the, the scale of it, it was completely overwhelming to me. I found it interesting that you might live in Europe, for instance, or in America, and completely ignore that whole huge part of the world. And we're talking about a billion people in India. When you confront it every day, you know deep inside you that there's not going to be any world peace unless there's some kind of wealth distribution somehow, because... Those people are also human beings. They don't have lesser needs than we do. If you're a journalist, you have to confront it. And when you confront it, you know, it's a very, for me, it was something very difficult to confront because, first of all, of course, I felt powerless, but also I, I was angry. I was angry that I, I hadn't acknowledged that before. I had no idea uh, of that reality. So that's something that really um, stayed with me. Journalist and author Marianne Pearl She was married to the Wall Street Journal correspondent Daniel Pearl and was expecting their first child when he was kidnapped and murdered by Islamic extremists. In her memoir, A Mighty Heart, Marianne Pearl writes of her increasing awareness in Karachi of the human cost of poverty. Here's a reading from that book. As I awaken, I struggle for the right words to describe this place. It is the curse of all journalists, I suppose, to be writing a story even as you're living it. There are so many people in this city, but no one seems to know how to count them all. Are there 10 million, 12, 14? Most of Pakistan is landlocked, pressed between India and Afghanistan, with parts of its borders touching southwestern Iran and the farthermost reaches of China. But Karachi, on the brown coast of the Arabian Sea, is the country's major port and, as such, is a magnet for migrants who drift in from the Pakistani countryside and across the border from even poorer places, Afghan villages, Bangladesh, the rural outposts of India. By day you see the poor burn under the scorching sun, selling vegetables and newspapers at dusty crossroads. At night they disappear in the labyrinthine streets, lending the city an air of foreboding. To us, this third world city may glow with a feeble light, but Karachi draws the desperately poor like a torch draws fireflies. From Marianne Pearl's book, A Mighty Heart, the inside story of the Al-Qaeda kidnapping of Danny Pearl. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is Speaking of Faith from American Public Media. Today, A Spirit of Defiance, a conversation with Marianne Pearl on terrorism, love, and survival. She came face to face with the violence of al-Qaeda extremists, even as, as a journalist, she was analyzing the social conditions that breed terrorism and extremism.
I asked Marianne Pearl if she tried at the time to make sense of the larger context in which her husband died, not just who killed him, but what drove them. You know, he was killed by hatred. And to me, to put a a label on that hatred, you know, to know whether he was killed as an American, as a journalist, as a Jew, it doesn't matter so much. Whatever label you put on it doesn't change anything to me. Uh, It's not worse or better to have died because you were American or because you were Jewish. You know, both ways has no, this is not a reason to kill someone. So uh, I am very suspicious of uh, labels. And, uh, you know, if they use that, I'm certainly not... You mean the labels they put on him as reasons? On him, you know, they kill them as a symbol, right? Uh, So symbolism is something I'm very wary of. And, uh, you know, they definitely use that to justify their action. For me, it's crap. You know, uh, they killed a man, and that's why I wrote a book, because, okay, here's the reality, here's the truth. That's the man you've killed. And that's something that is my reality, and that's who I lost. I didn't lose a symbol. I didn't lose a Jew. I didn't lose an American. You know, I lost Danny. So um, that's the blindness of terrorists, you know, who, in front of their own people, justify action by saying, you know, this was the enemy which is a big lie. So so for me, it's important to clearly state that, you know, there's no color on, on hatred. One reason is, is not better than the other. You quote a letter that a Pakistani journalist wrote to your friend Azra, that we have a depressed society and all other avenues are closed. Only this avenue of violence is open. I'm not asking you to excuse whether you excuse the men who killed your husband. I, that would be a, a ridiculous question. But I I wonder if your thoughts in trying to make sense of this, of how this could happen, if you do look at the larger context in which this happened and find some reasons there for for how this could happen. You know, I know that for a long time uh, that this can happen. I know it because because it's enough to travel to know that. It's enough to explore the world. Uh, you know, for instance, in the Arab world, once you, I, I, I'm pretty familiar with the Muslim world. And when I traveled on Nigeria or even in Gaza Strip or um, Morocco, whatever, uh, or Pakistan, you see um, thousands and thousands of young men who are frustrated in every way, uh, you know, including sexually. Um, have no perspective, oh, no work, no hope, no nothing. You know something is going to happen. You know it's going to either implode or explode, but something is going to happen because they are human, and you know what human means. You can, you're not a cow. You can't just like stay there and, mm. until you die. So it, it, this is like a common sense. So I knew that for a long time, and Danny knew it too. I think you know that's something we've been very aware of for a very long time, and and that's when I say you know it's time to maybe embrace the complexity of the world. Because it's not fair to just say, oh, you know, they're just bad guys out there. You know, the, mm-hmm. a lot of those people who are involved in Al-Qaeda operation are illiterate, young, you know, maybe they're 25 years old, completely desperate young men. But it is true that they have no access to education. They have no access to dream, period. Uh, they have no access to hope. Could you have thoughts like this in the midst of what was happening to you when Danny had disappeared and you didn't know whether he was alive or dead? Yes, you know, you can change reality. I mean, it's it's something that anybody, whatever your beliefs are and your political inclinations are, everybody can see that. It's just common sense. And so it's just a matter of, are you going to open your eyes or not? But if you are going to have some kind of honesty to the world, you realize that it's impossible. And if you have a knowledge of also the history of the region, then you understand. I think it's a pretty easy task to be a terrorist over there. You know, it's easy to recruit people mm. because all the elements are there. And what you're saying is is very straightforward, but I think it's pretty remarkable that you can say that, having gone through what you've gone through, having lost your husband to those dynamics. Marianne Pearl writes, Another official-looking man in his mid-thirties, polite and smiling and dressed in a suit, summons me with a discreet gesture. He tells me he is from an acronym's police branch and he asks for a photo of Danny for the needs of the inquiry. We happen to have made identity photographs recently, and I riffle through Danny's computer bag for his. When I pull it out, Danny's sweet and slightly ironic glance crosses mine, and something suddenly starts screaming inside me. I experience an instant of pure panic. 
I feel a devastating urge to charge into the streets shouting his name, demanding that he be given back to me now. The anger that rushes through me goes well beyond the hellish night I've just lived through. In a flash, I feel a terrible bond, not only with the victims of September 11th, but also with the kids brainwashed to become instruments of death in the name of an invented Islam. The terrible absurdity of it all overwhelms me. From Marianne Pearl's memoir, A Mighty Heart. You were asking me about forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness for me is not so much, it's not an incentive. Like I have no incentive to forgive those people. And to a certain extent, they, uh, particularly those who made decisions, are responsible for what they did and they should probably die for it. So I'm not forgiving them. And even though the situation is the way I described it, it doesn't mean that everybody goes into fundamentalism. And I think at some point what they learned what to do in, in terrorist camps is to even, you know, there's no wisdom there. There's, there's not any more logics. Uh, it's just passion, right? Hmm. So um, in my own personal challenge, I, I'm not interested in forgiving them, but I'm, I'm interested in winning over them. And I think because I've understood them and I've, and I've seen them and I've faced them, I know them. And uh, I know what I'm facing, and I know how to. Thus, I know how to to challenge it. Well, what does it mean to win over them? What does that mean? Well, it means something very, um, very deep and very personal. But you know, for to give you an example, um, if I was somebody who could not trust people anymore because of what happened to Danny, then they would have claimed some part of my soul. I guess you know, mm. if I was uh, overwhelmed by bitterness or if I hated Muslim, which is you know, all of, all of those are goals that they're trying to achieve by act of terrorism. When they kill a target, whether it is 3,000 people or one person like Danny, it's the same goal. It's like, you know, it's not about the people who they kill. It's about the people who relate to them. So because what they're trying to achieve through acts of terrorism is so clear to me, so clear that I was able to stand up against those goals each time I did it. And that's what gave me the strength. Uh, I knew that if, you know, if I was going to be bitter, I was going to be half dead. And that's exactly what they wanted. Right. I can't do that. Uh, it's impossible, I, but it's a defiance. It's not a forgiveness. I have no reason to forgive them. You know, defiance is not a Buddhist term, but I do sense <laughs> your. I do sense a sort of fierce Buddhist. Uh, I'm practice a fierce Buddhist running maybe, right? beneath that. <laughs> Uh, now, Buddhism, I think, you know, there's, um, there's uh, 84,000 teachings, actually, in Buddhism. So it's, you know, I guess, I, and I, I don't know them all at all. I'm, uh, I'm not a specialist. I know the one I practice. For instance, here's the tool. When I, uh, you know, when I feel, I have legitimate feelings of, for instance, you know, anger, I chant for, to, to overcome that anger. But it's more of a determination than a prayer in a way. Um, but I use the force of Buddhism, like whatever he brings me, uh, whatever he wakes in me to achieve my goals. You know, I don't look in the text to see whether it's a Buddhist attitude or not. You know, I just, um, what I do is to be as honest and sincere with myself as I can be. And that really works with Buddhism. And, you know, I like it that it's not a, it's not a philosophy that has its moral and what is good. You don't know. You don't know what's good, what's bad. You know, it's more like what's value creating and what's, what isn't. Mm. So, for instance, yeah, it, is, it is a Buddhist victory for me to, uh, I mean, that, that I relate to Buddhism, the fact that I can live, for instance, you know, that I can love after all that and uh, that I can uh, understand, for instance, the, the, in Pakistan, I, I chanted, obviously, to try to save Danny. And I think what Buddhism brought me at that time was a, a very strong insight in what's, what was going on. I think... Danny and I were very, very aware of what was going on, I think. In that place. Yes, mm -hmm. I think uh, we were in the same mind frame. I think Danny knew he could die. I think I knew he could die. Uh, and I think uh, we both knew that somehow we had to oppose those people. And he did it in the face of death, and he did it through gestures, and, you know, in the photos. There were photos of him, and you can see him giving the fingers or showing the V for victory. And, you know, he did what he could. And, you know, some sentences that he, that he said also in, um, in the video that was going to document his murder. So he did it in the face of death, and I did it in the face of, uh, of life, you know, but it's the same defiance. From Marianne Pearl's memoir, A Mighty Heart. 
to the end, he fought back. In the video, my friends tell me, Danny says, my father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, I am Jewish. Yes, I'm sure they made him say that. But here is how I know Danny was undefeated to the end. He says on the video, in the town of B'nai Barak in Israel, there's a street called Chaim Pearl Street, which is named after my great-grandfather, who was one of the founders of the town. This was not a piece of information his captors could have known or forced Danny to utter before the cameras for their propaganda purposes. The choice of those words and the decision to say them was pure Danny Pearl, his own act of defiance, essentially saying, if you are going to kill me for who I am, then do it, but you won't have me. Danny said this for me and for our son and for his parents. He said it so we'd know, so we would be proud, so we would go on. His words about the past created a future. This is Speaking of Faith. After a short break, Marianne Pearl's stories of the Pakistani policemen who helped her through her ordeal and the human face they put on the war on terror. The interesting part was that we ended up being two Jewish people, one Buddhist, two Catholic, and two Muslim. So that's where we were. And so I think the reason why people became so deeply involved was that it was almost like two visions of the world were fighting each other. Also ahead in our conversation, the birth of her son, Adam. Many times we can't fit all of my conversation into the radio broadcast. Here's your chance to hear what was cut. Go to our website, speakingoffaith.org, and hear my complete, unedited conversation with Marianne Pearl. Also, listen to our program at your convenience. Sign up for our email newsletter and subscribe to our podcast containing free downloadable audio and bonus material. Discover more at speakingoffaith.org. I'm Krista Tippett. Stay with us. Speaking of Faith comes to you from American Public Media. Speaking of Faith is supported by Faith and Values Media and its Faith Streams Network, offering Youth Roots, an online community for youth leaders and their group members to hold meetings, post forums, blogs, and more. Interactive and online at faithstreams.com. Join the conversation about Speaking of Faith programs. Purchase discussion guides, program CDs, and other tools for your small group, book club, or classroom at speakingoffaith.org. Welcome back to Speaking of Faith, public radio's conversation about religion, meaning, ethics, and ideas. I'm Krista Tippett. Today, A Spirit of Defiance, my intimate 2004 conversation with author and journalist Marianne Pearl. Her story is dramatized in a new movie starring Angelina Jolie. The kidnapping and murder of Marianne Pearl's husband, Daniel Pearl, in 2002 in Karachi is a source of continued international speculation. Pakistani authorities convicted four men for the crime. One, Omar Sheikh, was given the death penalty, which he has appealed. In March of this year, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, al-Qaeda's third-in-command who is now in U.S. custody at Guantanamo Bay, confessed to Daniel Pearl's murder. 
Marianne Pearl is a French journalist of Cuban and Dutch extraction and a practicing Buddhist. Terrorists beheaded her husband and sent a videotape of that act around the world. But Pearl says they didn't win. In her memoir, she devotes great detail to the courage of the Pakistani security officers who fought to find her husband and save his life. She later told President George W. Bush that these men have barely functioning transportation and communications, yet they are on the front lines of the war on terrorism. I found this such an important part of your story. There's Captain, this Pakistani, right. was he a police officer? He's, a, he's an anti-terrorist um, okay. person. So he's, he's, he's from the police. He's from a special unit, but uh, he's, um, he's from the police corp, yeah. And you sort of refer to him with great respect and affection as Captain. Yes, I respect him a lot, yeah. And he's really another face of, of that part of the world and this struggle that we're engaged in together, uh, yeah. So he, he puts a human face to what I was telling you earlier, which yeah. is, it's not about Islam. It's not about Muslim. It's not about even Pakistani, <laughs> you know. Uh, this is not it. Like, you know, if people all claim those elements or features, it's just a hijacking. And if you see the people, the Muslim people, how, first of all, they've been suffering from terrorism uh, in that part of the world is the Shia Sunni killings. But also you see how... How like, can you imagine? I don't know which which is your religion, but if someone claims to be uh, of your religion to kill someone, it's horrible. They're taking your beliefs and they're making them, you know, something that destroys. It's about hatred. Uh, it's very difficult to deal with, and that's something that Captain had. So I, that's why I knew he was going to fight so hard against those people because he was personally attacked as a Muslim. Describe him, for someone who hasn't read the book, describe who he was and what role he played in your experience. He's a man who um, who has been in the army for a long time. That's why I nicknamed him Captain, even though it's, that's like a lower grade than he was. <laughs> <laughs> but then he started uh, finding terrorists and he had been um, uh, involved in the Shia killings in, in Pakistan. And uh, that's a horrible story because even in the time I was there, 11 doctors were killed. They were killing doctors, Shia doctors. So uh, 11 doctors, that's a lot of people, um, just targeted killing. So he had been dealing with that. He'd been working on that, those cases? Yes, he'd been working on those cases. So he had seen a lot of broken families and, and people that died for nothing. I mean, killing a doctor, I mean, how you know more ruthless can you be? That's just because it's the curing other people, you know, other Shia, whatever. Mm. But he's also, uh, he's a man, uh, he's a Muslim and he's a practicing Muslim and, and one of the most noble men I've ever met in my life. To me, he, he has all the beauty of Islam in him in what it brings to the people. I've seen, you know, people like him in other countries, what, in other parts of the world. What do you think of when you say that, when you, that phrase, the beauty of Islam? It's just that he's a man who has very high principles, and th those principles are brought to him by his religion, and he lives up to them. And that's what matters for him. So that makes beautiful people. Because mm. it's not only something out of yourself or, you know, the, just like the, the system in which you have been brought or whatever. It's something you have chosen for your own life. So when, when the time came, for instance, for Captain to decide whether he really should risk his life to save Danny, that's what, you know, went into his mind. He's like, as a Muslim, I have to do that. You know, this man is innocent. I have to save him. I wonder if you could take us inside that house in Pakistan as you've learned that Danny had died. Tell me what happened and where this wonderful spiritual balance that you have, what was that with you in that moment? Well, I think, um, as I said earlier, what the real benefit of having practiced and chanted uh, at that moment, I think, was that I was so clear on what was going on. This is a time where I didn't think about myself at all. For the first time, I thought, okay, the reality is like one of us made it and the other one didn't. So that's, I had to confront that. But otherwise, I was so clear on who killed Danny and why they killed Danny and what I had to do to to oppose that. That's what saved my life, I think. Um, it was a time where if if I was going to live on because at some point, you know, we we're going to forget or 
get over it. I don't think I would have done anything like that. Was it your friend and protector, Captain, who gave you the news when they finally yes. learned? Yes, yes, yes. And I, I know it was very striking how brokenhearted he was and all the people, all the police officers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very uh, strange um, thing to see all these um, tough guys, because they are very tough guys. You know? Obviously, they're fighting tough guys, too. So they are very trained and very, um, you know, emotionally and physically, and, uh, but they were all crying because they had involved themselves so much and because... Then he was dead, and because they liked me, and they were felt a real kinship, I think, with me and with Adam. And I think they they did that because they thought I was very courageous, and uh, that gave them a lot of hope, I think. So that's uh, that was my role in this house. Um, yeah. To give everyone else hope. Yeah, 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 exactly. It would have been different if I, if I had been, you know, it might be difficult to convey, but that's what Buddhism brought me at that moment. I mean, I could face... What happened, and if I had, they had someone who were was more uh, had more less defenses, it would have been a completely different story. We led a war; it was a war, but that was possible because of me. And it's not really me, but it was faith at that moment. Mm. And Buddhism, I think, one of the big aspects of Buddhism is the, is the wisdom, is insight. That's what it brings you. So I really needed that at the time. Journalist Marianne Pearl, here's a reading from her memoir. On our last night, I invite over all the men who helped me look for Danny. Randall snags beer and bad wine for the non-Muslims and the non-pregnant from the U.S. consulate commissary. We gather in a circle, and for a while we sit in silence. Finally, I find my voice. You are the bravest men I have ever met. You went straight to hell where darkness is the deepest because you hate injustice and racism and tyranny. You did it for Danny and for me and for our child, but you also did it on behalf of the rest of the world. You were on the front lines of the fight against terrorism, and still, nobody knows you and how brave you are. Nobody sees how your willingness to fight the darkest threat for humanity actually makes each one of you shine as an individual. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is Speaking of Faith from American Public Media, today in conversation with journalist Marianne Pearl. The security officials who supported her during the ordeal of her husband's kidnapping in Pakistan were joined by friends and family from several countries. For five weeks before Daniel Pearl's body was discovered, they formed a community in the house where she was staying, watching, searching, and praying around the clock. Looking back, Marianne Pearl sees in that mix of humanity an alternative to the terrorists' vision of the world. The interesting part was that we ended up being two Jewish people, one Buddhist, two Catholic, and two Muslim. So that's where we were. And so I think the reason why people became so deeply involved was that it was almost like two visions of the world were fighting each other. And in one hand, there were the people who were held Danny captive and had some fascism, you know, as, as a vision for the future. And we were the world. And uh, mm-hmm. so it was almost two ideologies fighting each other. And I think everybody just threw themselves in in this battle because of its um, almost symbolic value. We could not let those guys win. That cannot be the future of the world. And everybody, I think, at some point was ready to die for that. You know, I'm sure someone would hear the description you just gave of these two worlds, the terrorists who were holding your husband and who killed him, and then this world of people fighting that. And they would say that they won, that the bad guys won. But that's not, that's not what comes through your book. I mean, how do you explain that way you came out of this? For me, they clearly haven't won until I'm still standing. <laughs> Uh, because to take somebody's life is nothing, you know. If you seven, eight people in a room and the person has shackled and you kill him, you know, then that's not a victory. And there is something uh, bigger than that. And the spirit is what makes us human. And 
that's the only way you can challenge those people because physically I could never be as ruthless as they are and I'm not interested in being as ruthless as they are. So that's not even something I'm considering. But you cannot get hold of a strong spirit. And I think that's why Danny opposed them. That's why I opposed them. And that's why hopefully our son will oppose them. And that's something, whatever you do, you can imprison someone, you can kill that person. If they resist you mentally, you, that's it. You haven't claimed anything. And I think they know that. You mentioned your son just now, and we haven't even talked about the fact that when you were going through this, you were pregnant. And I have to say, for me, reading the book, it seemed like such a miraculous and necessary part of the story that you had a part of Danny inside you, right, that you then brought into the world after he died. Mm-hmm. I received some letters saying that he was the Messiah or he was, you know, the son of Jesus. <laughs> he's not. He's a, he's a child, and I think he's, uh, he really is the best of us. I'm more and more confident about this fact. And he's, he represents victory, I think, also. That, that's a concrete element because, you know, he could have died pretty easily just because of the stress and because of what we went through. And bringing him into the world in good health was one of my concrete, when, is, is a manifestation, is a result of my determination not to let those people win. Mm. But if I was going to bring him into the world, I was going to bring him happiness. I was not going to bring a kid to which I had no hope to offer. So that was very clear to me. So it, it meant that I had to win my, my fight. Could you tell the story that you tell in the book about just how you spent the couple of days before you went into labor? Well, it was just a very difficult time because um, we had found Danny's body in Pakistan and uh, a lot of um, details about what happened to him. And and he was very graphic and he was very horrible, very ruthless. And I was finding that out. I mean, I found, I found things out just by chance in a way because I was trying not to read emails and not to, uh, I mean, trying to concentrate on the birth, but I did find some emails and and read about it. So I realized it, the, the violence is something that terrorists use as a tool. Violence is, is made to terrify you. You know, It's a very concrete, cold-minded thing. So um, the more violent they can be, the more they have power over you because you can't beat them. So I knew that uh, violence was meant for us to, to be paralyzed. I was worried because I had never had a child and I knew that birth is something that kind of overwhelms you and all kinds of feelings can appear or things like that. So um, I knew that the violence, you know, that that's when I had to confront the violence before I gave birth because if I didn't do that, then it would have some power over me. Uh, it might be too much or it might be paralyzing me or, or taking strength away from me. So I did that and I... Um, I isolated myself and I uh, thought about everything that I had to think about. And, you know, I'm not going to say more than what I said in the book because part yeah. of it is very personal and belongs to me. But You really thought about what you knew concretely about what had happened. Yeah, I, I confronted the violence, you know, mm-hmm. I, and I thought about that and I thought about, you know, everything that I need to think about and I, I did it. But um, I did it, in a, again, in a spirit of defiance. Like it, it was something that, that was the ultimate thing that could make me collapse with, you know, the, the, the amount of violence that then he was confronted with. One thing that really helped me was that he died pretty fast and he doesn't know what happened afterwards. So that's something that helped. And I was so close to him that somehow for me it was like, you know, once we died, we died. And, you know, the rest is for us to be traumatized. Uh, It's done for us. So I I needed to do that and I did it. I, I isolated myself for two days and I did that. And then he went into labor. Yeah, but at the end of that, two, those two days, I you know I knew I, it was going to be okay. Adam was going to be fine. And do you still feel that way now? Is was it the cathartic experience that you wanted it to be? Did you really get that out? Yes and no. I mean, sometimes it comes back to you, and that's something to deal with. Uh, but I was not trying to get over it uh, because there was no way to get over it. I was trying to to not let them win, you know, and letting them win was would be anything from having a very difficult labor to Adam not making it. Uh, so I was I was fighting. I was not trying to uh, heal. Mm. And I think I'm still in that same mood. Journalist Marianne Pearl. Her son was born nearly four months after his father's death. 
But early in the pregnancy, Daniel Pearl had already chosen the baby's name, Adam. He would be, Pearl said, a universal baby. Adam is, um, in his veins, he has blood from Iraq and from Poland, from Israel, from Holland, from Cuba. Uh, that's our four origins. And then, you know, his father is American and I'm French. And it was conceived in Bombay. And blah, blah. You know, so the whole <laughs> world is in this little kid, a little child. And, you know, and it was a wishful thinking that hopefully that would be the people in the 21st century, that, you know, they can live with all these cultures and origins with, with inside them and just be beautiful. It seems like he's he's a physical embodiment of that that parallel world you described in your house in Pakistan. Um, right, exactly. All yeah. those people right. countering that world of terrorism. Right, exactly. Tell me about Adam. What's he like? He's very, uh, he's, uh, he's adorable. I mean, I'm not objective, but... Um, you know, he looks adorable. I saw his he's picture. He's very, he's very nice. He's a very um, caring and loving and funny little child. He's a good traveler, <laughs> obviously, and um, he's, uh, he's very joyful. He's a very joyful kid. Hmm. I know you worried so much, which any, I mean, mothers worry, pregnant women worry about everything, and then you were going through this huge trauma of how this would all be affecting him, what you were going through. I mean, do you still think about that as you watch him grow? Uh, people were more worried than I was. Uh, I think um, a lot of people around me were completely uh, so scared that he would be everything. Uh, and I wasn't scared because to me, um, it felt like we're either going to make it or not. But just during this whole time, we were, it f- felt to me like we were one entity. So I was not making any separation between me and Adam at that time because it was just such a life and death situation. So um, that's something very difficult to to communicate, but I did, he was always, a, for me, um, like as I wrote in the book, I, I trusted him, and I don't know how you can trust a fetus, <laughs> you know. But I did, I really did. I felt like, you know, okay, I don't have to worry about him. Or, or if I had, then, then, then it's about all of us. It's about the three of us. So... Um, to me, he was just part of us, and, and he was exactly in the same fate. He was more uh, actually a reassuring presence than he was a person I was worried about. I, um, people panicked around me, that, that's, that's for sure. They really wanted like, a doctor to come, and I knew that you know, it, was, it was deeper than that. We, it, was a, it was a deeper battle than, you know, than regular worries that people have. Same thing when I, when I gave birth and people told me about the baby blues. I was like, you know what? <laughs> Uh, you know, sure, you know, I have a baby blue, whatever. You know, it's um, it was uh, much deeper than that. So the only thing for me is, is you know, I'm going to have to tell him the story, so I'm going to have yeah. to to find the, the world, and and I will. Um, so when you think of him growing as an individual, like, like as, a, as, a, as a third person, then, you know, you have to just see how you're going to deal with the situation. But it's his fate, it's his story too, and... Uh, um, I don't know. I think um, he's going to have a strong sense of his father. You published your memoir really pretty quickly after mm-hmm. the events. And I wonder if just at this remove of months, is there anything as you've continued to live with this and make sense of it that you think you might have written differently or included? Not at all. I have absolutely no regret. Uh, there's, there are things I haven't written about and I could write about, but the purpose of this book was to to just give my experience, tell the story from my point of view. And I did exactly that. And I just went back step by step to everything that we went through. And and with no, I didn't step back. I didn't interview anybody. I just told my experience. And I needed to do that for Adam, just that he knows the truth. When I'm going to tell him 10 years from now, we'll have 10 years. Because I never cashed it. <laughs> because she, for me, she represents the number of people who who just expressed everything they could to to help and an amazing empathy. So um, from that kind of people to a man that is on a death row, for instance, in Pakistan for blasphemy, you know, and he's going to die and still he thinks that it's important that he communicates, you know, his solidarity to us and, and he's worried that we have the wrong impression of Islam and... To me, you know, it feels like a lot of those letters were written with, like, raw soul. There was no personal interest there. There was just a real solidarity. And to me, they're very important, those letters, because 
I think, you know, we were talking about Adam and I think, you know, he's going to have to confront like a story of absolute darkness because that's exactly what those guys are. But on the other hand, you know, you can only oppose light to darkness. And that light is those letters. Mm-hmm. I mean, those letters, that that's what they represent for me because to that you can only, rep- you know, light and, and the only light we have is the light of our humanism, right? And that's what they express, uh, wherever they come from. You know, they can, you know, some people are very known, some people are not well known. Right, there are several presidents in there, but there are also just average people. Yeah, exactly. It's not like there's less chance maybe that a president would be sincere, you know, and I published those I thought were sincere. But, you know, it comes down to because it's about a life and death and, and the death of an innocent man to humanism. You know, there's something common to all of us. We can all express and, and they have those people. And for Adam, they are, I think, going to be the balance that will make the world a possible place to live. Marianne Pearl lives in Paris. She currently writes the Global Diary column for Glamour magazine, profiling women around the world. The film adaptation of her book, A Mighty Heart, the inside story of the Al-Qaeda kidnapping of Danny Pearl, opens nationwide this month. We'd love to hear your thoughts about today's program. Contact us at speakingoffaith.org. Our companion site includes audio of my complete, unedited conversation with Marianne Pearl. And sign up for our email newsletter and our podcast, which includes MP3s of current and past programs. Now look for SOF Extras, too. Listen to Speaking of Faith in the way that best fits your life. Discover more at speakingoffaith.org. Senior producer of Speaking of Faith is Mitch Hanley, with producers Colleen Sheck and Jody Abramson and associate producer Jessica Nordell. Our online editor is Trent Gillis. Bill Buesenberg is our consulting editor. Kate Moose is the managing producer of Speaking of Faith. And I'm Krista Tippett. Speaking of Faith is supported by Faith and Values Media and its Faith Streams Network, offering web medley, a suite of tools for congregational use for web design and publishing, RSS, podcasts, and streaming video and audio. Available nationwide, faithstreams.com. Sustainability coverage supported by Calvert, mutual funds, college savings, and retirement investments in companies committed to responsible environmental, social, and governance practices. Online at calvert.com. Additional support is provided by the Ford Foundation, a resource for innovative people and institutions worldwide, on the web at fordfound.org. The Luce Foundation's Henry R. Luce Initiative on Religion and International Affairs, and the George Family Foundation, funding innovative ideas in integrative medicine, education, and spirituality in everyday life. Next week, we'll explore the truth about voodoo, an ancient African tradition and the national religion of the Haitian people. Please join us for the next Speaking of Faith. American Public Media.